All right, we'll get straight into the sermon then. Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse number 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4, we continue the, the series on the family. And it says here, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The title for the sermon tonight is A Nurture and Admonition of the Lord. You see, fathers and parents were instructed to raise up our children. We're instructed to step in and direct them, to guide them, to train them in the admonition, the nurture and the admission of you? No. Of your parents, how they trained you? No. Of how society says that you ought to train your kids? No. How the school says? It? No, no, no. Of the Lord, the Bible says that. Of the Lord. And you see, there are two things that are very important to the raising of children. It's the nurture and admonition. The nurture and admonition. You see, some parents... Just have the nurturing. They spend all the time nurturing and no admonition. Other parents do all the admonition and no nurturing. And some parents do neither. It's just let the kids do whatever they want. Just let them, let them live out, how, you know, grow up however they like. And, and basically that's the family where the kids runs the show. But we need to understand what these two fundamental aspects are of raising your children. You cannot have one without the other. And you can see it's by the instruction that the Lord gave us. See, to nurture is the idea of to nourish. Nurture and nourish have similar root words. You know, when you nourish yourself, what are we doing? We're, we're feeding the body, right? We're feeding our body. We're taking care of ourselves. So to nurture is the idea of feeding the child to receive nutrients as he grows thereby. But not, well, obviously, we're not talking about food. We're to, not talking about the physical here. We're talking about the raising of that child. And that means we are to teach them. We are to instruct them. We are to provide direction for our children so they know how to live and function in this world. They know how the Lord feels about certain things because everyone else is contrary to the Word of God. You need to raise them in the nurture teaching your children, giving them the ammunition they need in accordance to God's word to be trained up and have knowledge. What is it to admonish? When you say, I'm going to admonish this person, that means you're going to correct that person. It's not all just training, it's not just nourishing that child, but it's also correcting that child, telling them they're to blame when they've done wrong. Hey, I know parents, when their kids do wrong, Oh, not little Johnny. I've got a little Johnny. You know, but you know, not little Johnny couldn't, you know, he, he, he would never do that. No. When your child does wrong, you tell them they are to blame. You tell them they could have done better. Uh, and it's about disciplining your child, correcting, knowing them knowing when they've done wrong and receiving the right discipline that God has instructed to us in the Bible. All right, the nurture and admonition, not of Dr. Phil, not the nurture and admission of Super nanny, not the super nanny, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We take these things from the Word of God. You don't need to turn there. Actually, I'll get you to turn to, uh, you, can guys, you guys go to Colossians chapter 3 for me, please. Colossians chapter 3. We'll get there in a while, but I'm going to read to you from Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, while you guys are turning to Col uh, Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says in Malachi 2, 15, and did, not, and did not he make one? Did God not make one? And the reference to this is the one flesh. What is the one flesh? It's the marriage union. When you're married, husband and wives, the Bible says you are one flesh. It says here, yet had the residue of the spirit and wherefore one. Why did God create one? What's the, what's the significance of the one flesh? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You see, the Lord has given marriages, husbands and wives, that one flesh, the union in marriage, the union of flesh, to create that godly seed. And it's, you know, it's not just have seed. It's not just be fruitful and multiply. It taught us in, in Malachi 2.15, a godly seed. You know, people say, wow, well, you know, my wife's pregnant with number 11 now, right? How is it that you guys have so many kids? Honestly, having children is the easiest part of life. It's raising the children. It's raising them to be good children. It's raising them to know the Bible. It's raising them to know what's wrong. That's the hard part. Because that's what you're doing for the next 20 years of your life. Having children, 
takes what? Nine months, right? Nine months, that child's born, praise God, but now you've got to raise that child till adulthood or until they get married and leave the home. It's a much difficult job. Some people have done very well. Yeah, very well. They have lots of children. Praise God for that. But then they fail at the nurture and admonition of the Lord and their children run, run wild, run wild. I've, I've seen many families like that. And it's a real shame because God is seeking not just many seed, but he's also seeking the godly seed. All right. So in order to raise a godly seed, we must follow the instructions that God has given us to, to raise them in the nurture, training them and the admonition when they do wrong, when they fail, the discipline, the correction, uh, of the Lord according to the Lord so we're going to basically look at these two ideas tonight the nurture and admonition let's start off with nurture what is it about nurturing that I want to advise you and I've got a few points here I've got four points when it comes to nurturing your children okay number one is to set rules set some boundaries in your house one thing that I've learned with children and uh, and I I think I I think I, 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 I um I'm qualified. I think I'm qualified to say these things with 10 kids, right? I think I'm qualified. One thing that I've noticed that makes happy children are boundaries. But society thinks, no, 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 no. If you want happy children, have no boundaries. If you want your ch- you know, happy children, let them do as they please. Listen, families that have boundaries, families that have rules in their homes, guess what? The children are happier. Children know exactly what mom and dad expect from me. When they do right, they're happy. They know mom and dad are pleased. And when they break that rule, oh no, I've broken the rules of mom and dad. And when they're corrected, yes, there might be some tears at the beginning, but there's also joy that follows it because they've been corrected. They've seen where that rule is. It's so important that you set rules, not just for your home, but for your church. When your children come to church, you know, instruct your children to sit in the seats you know, instruct them not to run around and to scream and to carry on. You know, you need to set the same rules. You know, I mean, would you allow your child to run around and go screaming and, and, and throw things around in your house? I hope not. You know, that should be the same rules that you have in the house of God. You know, the same rules in the church. And not just in the home in the church, but in public areas. The shops. Uh, have you ever gone shopping and seen just kids go wild? Right, taking things off the off the shelves, throwing them on the floor, chucking a tantrum, you know, begging mom and dad to buy them lollies or whatever other things. Hey, that's poor behavior. You need to make sure you set rules in the home, the church, at the shops. And the easiest thing to do is to have the rules pretty much the same across the board. As you expect your children to behave in public places, as you expect your children to behave in church, should be the same behavior that you expect them to have in the family home. I mean, that's where they're spending most of their hours, all right? When a child is unable to sit still, say in church, that just tells me they're not being taught how to sit still in the home, okay? Or they are sitting still, but they're, maybe, maybe they're sitting still with eight hours of television, all right? So they come to church. I'm not as entertaining as Donald Duck, or, uh, well, I don't know, what shows are there these days? <laughs> ben 10, that's, uh, that's not past my time. You know, I'm, I'm not as entertaining as the Transformers, right? So when they come to church, you know, it's not as entertaining. So, so they don't know how to sit still. But kids need to learn how to sit still. And one piece of advice that I would strongly recommend parents, especially with little ones, is teach them how to have church at home. One thing that we trained our children was basically we sit down our children and we would have mini church. Now, we aim to have it every day, but we couldn't always do it every day for, for various reasons. Even if it's just once a week, even if it's a couple of times a week, you sit your children down, you read a chapter of the Bible. Parent, dads, you know, you're the spiritual head of the house. Give them a little spiritual lesson. Ask the kids, what did you get from that lesson? Pray, sing a hymn, and you're done. You're done in 15 minutes. But for those 15 minutes, your child learns to sit still. And in, during those 15 minutes, when your children are getting up and running wild and being distracted, you sit them down. You keep telling them this is important for us to sit down and pay attention to the reading and preaching of God's word. And if, you can, if you're able to accomplish that in your home, your children are going to have no problem in the church. No problem at all in the church. So set the rules as similar as possible in these different areas. And of course, why do we set rules? Because God set rules. 
right? God sets boundaries. Praise God for that. We've got an entire book, 66 books of the Bible that gives us rules, that gives us boundaries. You know, what is sin? The Bible defines sin as the transgression of the law. You see, when you break those rules, when you break those boundaries that God has set in his word, you commit sin. And the Bible tells us that we have a loving father who will discipline us, who will chastise us when we commit sin. And that, that comes to the, the admonition uh, later on. But listen, we set rules. I instruct you to set rules, not because I think I'm the wisest man on the earth. It's simply because God the Father sets rules for his children. And of course, he would be the best example by which we can learn these things. Of course, he set the rule for Adam. And I think Adam and Eve is a really great uh, representation of the Bible and the rules that God sets for us. Because when God uh, created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, how many rules did God give them? Just one. Just one. Hey, Adam, enjoy. Eat from every tree that you like. Except that one tree. All right, that one tree. And the, idea, the concept we get there is the God that we serve isn't a God who's striving to put us in prison. He's not striving to make life so difficult that every corner we're wondering, are we breaking God's laws? You know, God has liberty. The Bible tells us that his truth will make you free. You know, and, and, uh, and so we need to understand that when we, we are saved, when we're born again, we have that new man. And if you're walking in that new man, guess what? You will be naturally obeying the rules and commands of God because you're being led by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not you about checking every little bit. Did I break that rule today? Did I break? Now, you probably will break the rules every day because we're all sinners. We all have that sinful flesh. But when we do that, we should go and confess those sins to the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 3 now. Colossians chapter 3 verse 20. What are the benefits of rules? Colossians chapter 3 verse 20. The Bible says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. For this is well pleasing to the Lord. Parents, do you want your family to be well pleasing to the Lord? Do you want the Lord God to look down at your house, to look at your home, your family, your children and say, wow, this family pleases me. This family gives me joy. This, this family gives me uh, uh, you know, satisfaction. I, I can, uh, you know, I, I'm pleased to look at this family well, what do you have to do? Your children must obey your parents in all things. So you've got to have things in order for them to obey those things. And those things are the rules, right? The rules, the boundaries that you have in the house. Make sure your children obey those things. And when they, when they obey you, when you have obedient children, you know, it pleases the parents naturally, right? It, naturally, you're pleased when your children do what's right. But even better, you know, God is pleased with your family. God is pleased with your children. Well, what a great thing that we can uh, please the Lord God by having obedient children. So number one for nurture was to set rules. Number two, the point number two that I have on the nurture is to lead by example. Parents, you should be leading your children by example. This is why it's so easy for children. You know, you turn on the TV and they get distracted like that. Right, you give an iPad, they're distracted like that. Children are, are, are visual learners. Okay? Uh, you know, it can take time for a little baby to start to talk and be able to communicate well with you. But one way they start learning immediately is by watching you or even watching their older siblings. You know, something I, I learned in life was uh, with the older siblings, with Isabel and Nicholas, we spent a lot of time, a, a lot of time. We invested so much time to teach them rules around the house, to teach them what's right and wrong, to obey and, and to, to uh, behave a certain way. But then when the other children came, they didn't, we didn't need to invest so much time. You know why? Because they'd watch Nicholas and Isabel. They'd watch the older siblings. And they'd be like, to them, it's like, okay, this is how they behave. This is how I'm supposed to behave. All right? But what if I did not invest that time with the older children? What if we let the older children run riot? Oh, you know, Isabel and Nicholas going nuts, going crazy. Guess what the other children are going to do when, they, when they're born? They're going to watch and they go, well, this is life. This is how it is. And they're going to run wild. Okay? So it, it's such a blessed thing when you have these larger families because your children actually learn from the investment you've made with the previous siblings as well. They learn by watching. But not only do they watch their siblings, they're watching mum and dad. And I'm telling you, parents, your kids are watching you like a hawk. 
They're watching you, all right? And they see all the little things that are kind of a little bit not right, all right? You know, I'll never forget, there was a time I was watching, uh, I had a TV and I was watching soccer or something. It's probably much the only thing I watch on TV, so, you know, was soccer. There was soccer was playing, then, you know, the ads come on, right? But this, this was a time when we had TV, we would watch it pretty much all the time. And I was, I was desensitized to the ads. You know, the ads come on and there's the rock music and there's, you know, women dressed immodestly or whatever. It's like, you're so desensitized that you don't even, you don't even pick up on it, you know, because, you, you know, for so many years you're watching television. And I remember, you know, I I Isabel. Isabel, she was probably only maybe four years old. I, I don't know. She was very, very young. And we were teaching our, our daughter, you know, about right music, godly music, and all these kinds of things, right? Dressing appropriately. And one day there was an ad on, and Isabel walks past and goes, Dad, that's evil. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's evil. And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course it is evil. You know, so I turned it off. You know, but I forgot. Like, I just totally forgot. But I realized that, you know, Isabel's watching. She sees the inconsistencies. She's been in church. She's heard the preaching. She's heard the uh, directions from mum and dad. And she wants to walk right. She wants to obey. She wants to do what's right. But then there comes a moment. Well, dad's not doing right here. You know, what's going on? And it's inconsistent. Thank God I had an outspoken child like that to get me right. But, you know, not all children are outspoken. Some children are very quiet and they absorb these things and they, it creates confusion for them as they grow up. And so it's important that parents, you lead by example. You know, we have too many parents that say, do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say and not, not as I do. That's a bad principle to live by because your children will do what you do. All right. And they will do it in excess. All right. If they see you living in some type of sin, they're going to grow up and commit the same sin and probably in excess as well with that sin. And they see you doing same, some righteous thing, they're going to grow up going, wow, I, mean, I need to do that righteous thing as well. And maybe in excess as well, which is great when it's righteous, Amen. you know, that's uh, awesome. And I, I'll never forget, there was a time when I, uh, you know, I, I, I walked into my father's bedroom, I was a little boy, and I saw my dad on his knees. I don't know if he was weeping, I can't remember, praying, we had his Bible open. It was a sight that I was not really familiar with seeing with my father, but I remember just stepping into the room. And I'm like, as a child, it's like, wow, if, if, if dad needs God, if dad needs the Bible and to be praying to the Lord, then I need the Lord too. Because I used to think my dad was the greatest man ever. You know, if there's anyone that was self-made, it would be my dad. But no, it looks like he needs the Lord, so I need the Lord too. You know, that's the effect your behavior parents has on your children. It's very difficult to tell your children not to do something when you're doing it yourself. You know, and uh, so this is number two is lead by example. You don't want your children to see you as a hypocrite. You know, and, and what I really would like to do is just basically tell you to challenge yourselves, parents. You know, what are you doing in the house that's inconsistent with the teachings that you give your children? Again, you might be like me, totally desensitized. Not, it's not even on purpose, you know, but you're probably doing something. And it's like, you know what, if my kids saw this, if my kids emulated this, this is probably not what I want my children to do. But here am I doing the same things. Your children need to see you reading your Bible. Your children need to see you praying. Your children need to see you loving the family, loving uh, dads, loving mother, uh, your wives and wives, loving your husbands and loving the children. That's how they grow affection. That's how they grow love. If they can learn how to love the family, they're going to grow up to learn how to love the brethren in the church, the brothers and sisters they have in the Lord. So point number one was to set rules. Point number two was to lead by example. Point number three is to teach your children Bible doctrine. Now, if you can go to Deuteronomy, please. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible says, I'll give you just a few minutes, to, seconds to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. This is the greatest commandment, by the way, Jesus says. Verse number 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
You see, these words that are being taught here are the laws that were passed down. The first primary uh, uh, application here uh, is the law of, Mo of, of God being passed down to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai. And these words, that was a scripture they had at the time, was to be taught to their children. And all the time throughout the house, right? When they sit in your house, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. You know, we have parents an opportunity to teach our children the scriptures all parts of, of the day. That's what we should be striving to do. You know, our little ones that can't read yet, that are learning to read, you should pick up the Bible and read it to them. You should pick up the Bible, read it to them and explain to them what they're hearing. So they become familiar with the word of God. You know, I did not start my Christian life with the King James Bible. I was already saved before I really got a, a hold of one. And I remember when I, when I picked up my first King James Bible, because of the style of English, I really struggled to, to come to grips with what it's saying, you know. And I was like, I was dedicated. I remember uh, we went to a trip. We would often tra travel to Chile with the family. I got a lot of family in Chile. And I, made, I, made, I just said, you know what, Lord, I'm not taking any books I'm not taking any Bible versions except the King James Bible with me and I'm going to be forced to read that one book. And I remember getting to my auntie's house one day, open up the Bible and I'm reading it. It's like, man, this makes perfect sense now. And, you know, it, it takes commitment. It takes work. It takes a bit of training, you know, uh, to, to understand this book. And of course, as your children grow up, the English that they're hearing from the King James Bible is, slightly, is obviously different to what they hear everywhere else. And so I, I believe it's important that you read from this book. You know, if you go to Kurong, they're going to have all these children's Bibles. You know, all these paraphrased stories of people in the Bible. They're not even accurate. I mean, check them out. They're not accurate many of the time. Right? Those children's Bible, don't waste your time on it. Open up the true word of God. Read it to your children. Let it be in their hearts at an early age. And they will be able to understand it at an early age. I don't know how many times Nicholas, for example, has read through his Bible now. Is it five or six times? That's probably more times than some of these adults that we have in this room. You know, Nicholas is 12 years old. He's, I think he's read it like six times, maybe more already the Bible. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen prepare sermons, 10-minute sermons to the church up there. It's all him. I'm not helping him. It's all him. He knows what references to turn to because he's been reading this book. He's been studying this book. He's been learning it, you know, uh, throughout his life. And uh, so we need to make sure that we teach our children the Bible. We teach our children Bible doctrine, even at a very, very early age. And this is actually, if you look at verse number seven again, and thou shalt teach them. This is the same as, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is a command of God. This is not an optional thing for parents. It's not like, maybe I will teach my kids the Bible. Maybe I will teach. No, no, no. Thou shalt do these things. These things God expects you to do. And if you're not doing that as a parent, you're failing in your parenting. You're failing in raising your children in the nurture of the Lord. You know, I, I, let me just give you some thoughts around this because I know uh, for children to read the Bible it can be challenging and uh, let me just give you some, some tips and things that we've applied with our children is, um, you know, you can motivate your children to read their Bibles for a prize. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, uh, you know, say, look, if you get through this book of the Bible, you know, whatever it is, a chocolate, whatever it is, you know, you'll get a prize. And that will motivate them. It will motivate them. And yes, you say, well, they're just reading for the chocolate. But here's the thing. They're reading the Bible. Right? They're getting the words of God. They're getting the words of life into their hearts as they read that and, and as things become clear. And here's the great thing. If your children get saved at an early age, as they're reading the Bible, they've got the Holy Spirit in them, teaching them. The Holy Spirit's job is to teach us these words. You know, so encourage them, motivate them, maybe with a prize if that's what you need to do. You know, read, I already mentioned this, but read a chapter as a family and ask your kids to explain what that chapter is about. Uh, they won't understand it, they'll get it wrong. Who cares? As long as they're making an effort, they're making an effort to hear it and try to convey what that chapter says, who cares if they get it wrong? Just correct them nicely and say, well, actually, that was about this. But at least they're putting the effort in, they're trying to make something out of what that chapter says. You know, the third thing I've got here is link their academic studies back to God's word as much as you can. 
You know, anything that they're studying. If you as a parent, if you're, especially if you're homeschooling, you know, you as a parent, you're teaching them something, and you say, hey, that's like the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Or, you know, you then, then, yeah, go to the Bible. Take and show them how this relates to, uh, to the Word of God. You know, there are a lot of common sayings that we use today, like, you know, you know, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, ki- I'm gonna kill. What, what's the, what's the saying? I'm gonna kill, kill two birds with one stone. Do you know that idea that you do one thing but you accomplish two things by doing that one thing? I can't remember which proverb it is, but it's in the Bible, all right? It's, 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 a, it's a variation of something that is in the book of Proverbs. There are a lot of uh, uh, terms that we use, a lot of language that we use uh, when we speak to one another that actually come through, stem back to the Word of God. You know, and uh, so, you know, try to link everyday life things, academic studies and everything else back to God's word. And um, I must have skipped my notes a little bit here, but as I wrote here that fathers can preach their family short lessons. Now, if you're someone that has a desire to one day be a pastor, you know, and, you know, I'm not even saying anything like soon or could be 10 years from now, could be a long time. But, you know, you have a desire. You think maybe the Lord wants me to be a pastor. Maybe that's something I need to work toward or take on some other office, um, you know, in the, in the church. You know, you may not always have the opportunity to get behind the pulpit, open the Word of God and preach the Word of God to the church. One thing you definitely can do is preach to your family. You can definitely use that opportunity, you know, to, to open God's word, preach your family. That's going to help you be, make, make you a better preacher. That's going to help you. And here's the thing, if you make mistakes, it's just your family, right? It's a little bit more embarrassing when you make mistakes in front of the body of Christ. So, you know, use, you know, fathers, the opportunity. You never know. You may not have the desire today. That desire may come to you at some point. There might be a need. And you might be the only one that can step up and feel that need. Hey, start thinking about these things. So the third thing that I had here under nurture was teach your family or children Bible doctrine. And uh, the fourth point that I have here, and I've got this as a fourth point because I know I struggle with this point, is encourage questions. Encourage your children to ask questions. There comes a point in time, and I think all parents have experienced this, at some point one of your children, your children grow up, and now they're just inquisitive about everything. Oh, Dad, what about this? Dad, why is the sky blue? You know, why is, I don't know, you know, anything, you know? I can't, I can't even think, but, you know, they just start asking all kinds of questions. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, I'll, I'll answer that later or, you know, stop, stop talking, stop answering. You know, there comes a point in your time when your children, I think all children go through this, where they become super inquisitive. They just want to know the answer to everything. And this is where fathers, many times we, 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 get, we fail because we get frustrated. When you don't realize this is a natural thing that God has put into children, they want to know. They want answers to the world. And guess what? They're going to the right person. They're going to you. Do you want them going to your school teacher, the unsafe school teacher? Do you want them going to their peers and asking the same questions? Where do you want them to go when they have all these questions about the world, when they have all these questions about life, when they have these questions about God? Who is it that you want your children to go to? It's you. And when they come to you with the questions, don't blow them off. You know, te- you know, be there to answer those questions. Give them a satisfying answer. Show them that you love them. Show them that you're interested in handling the questions and the things that are in their mind. Please go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And again, all these things are here because our Heavenly Father does these things for us. Right? Our Heavenly Father does all these things for us. We should make sure we give the same liberty, the same opportunities to our children as God the Father has given us. But go to James chapter 1 verse 5. James chapter 1 verse 5. James 1 5 reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. How does God the Father treat us as his children? God the Father says to us, if you need wisdom, if you need answers to questions, come and ask me. All right? Is that how you are with your children? Kids, you have questions? Come and ask me. 
And I tell you, I'm not always like that. I'm, just kid, I'm too busy right now. You know, kids, I, I, dad's got to get through this sermon for tomorrow for church. You know, <laughs> leave me alone. No, that's not the right approach. All right. The Bible tells us here, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Look at this. That give to all men liberally. You know what that means? Freely. God wants to give us wisdom. God wants us to give us answers. There's nothing we've hold in God. He wants us to give it, you know, uh, give us these answers, but sometimes we just don't go to him. We don't go to him. Sometimes our children, when they come to dad after a while, they ask a question, they ask the questions, and we blow them off. We blow them off. Not, you know, we blow them off. At some point, they'll stop asking. Uh, they'll stop asking. At some point, they'll stop asking the questions, and you, that's when you failed as a parent. That's when you failed, and you need to try to get that trust once again, that communication, once again, with your children. It says here, and upbraideth not. Give to all men liberty, and upbraideth not. Meaning he doesn't prevent it. He doesn't, he doesn't get angry at you when you ask all these questions to God. And it shall be given him. It shall be given him. Dads and mums, you know, mums as well, but I think dads, we struggle with this the most. Is, you know, we need to give our children the information that they need as they grow up. We need to make sure we answer their questions. And it says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Here's the thing. If we don't allow our children to come and ask us questions, right? Then it says here, they become, they'll, they'll, they'll get to a point where they waver. They're not going to have the faith that dad's going to answer. And our children could be like the second part of verse 6. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And I think parents, we, want our we don't want our children to be tossed to and fro. We, don't, we want our children to be stable-minded. We want our children to grow and mature and be sound in knowledge. You know, we don't want them wavering like this. And the key thing we need to learn from God the Father is we need to be fathers that answer our children's questions, that we encourage them to come and talk to us, that we communicate with them. So please, point number four is encourage questions. Okay, so let me just go through those four points again. Nurturing your children, number one, is set rules. Number two, lead by example. Number three, teach them Bible doctrine. And number four, encourage questions. Get the communication lines happening with your children. Okay, so it's not just raising your children in the nurture of the Lord. It was raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I've got some points here under admonish. How is it that we are to admonish our children. I think I've got six points here. Admonishing our children. Point number one is the Bible, well, uh, this is a little bit different, but the Bible is crystal clear on corrective discipline. Okay? The Bible is super clear of how we ought to correct our children when they are in disobedience, when they've broken those boundaries, when they've broken those rules. The Bible's completely consistent, it's not inconsistent. But I'll tell you what the Bible is inconsistent with. It's inconsistent with our society. It's inconsistent with the teachings that you're going to get from the current world as to how you ought to correct and discipline your children. Go to Proverbs 23, please. Proverbs 23. And many of the passages dealing with raising children and disciplining children come from the book of Proverbs. And everybody knows the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Everybody knows that. This is where if I need wisdom, I'm going to turn to the book of Proverbs. But when it comes to disciplining children, when it comes to getting the rod and, and, and carrying out that capital punishment for what they did wrong, oh, I'm not going to go to Proverbs for that. You know, that's old fashioned. I'm like, no. You know, the, the book of Proverbs has the answer. Proverbs 23 verse 14. Proverbs 23 verse 13. The Bible says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Amen. He shall not die. Okay? This is what happens. You know, kids, you, you know, the kids disobey. Dad gets the belt or whatever rod he has. And mom's like, no, not too hard. Hey, he won't die, mom. Relax. All right, he's just going to get a beating. He's not going to die. Relax. You know, dad's got in control. Encourage your, you know, uh, fathers to, to carry out corrective discipline. Not because Pastor Kevin says so. Because God said it. He's withhold not correction from the child. Don't withhold it. Yeah. Don't let it come to a point, oh, I'll just, I'll just let that go. I'll just let that go. Now look, later on I'm going to talk about letting things go. But I'll give it in the right context. But your first thought, if my child has disobeyed, he needs to be corrected. If my child has disobeyed, he needs to be beaten with the rod. 
That's the Bible word right there, right? If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse number 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Man, listen. All I want, priority number one for my children, is to be saved and go to heaven. Now, if they turn out to be a rotten child, a total derelict in this world, at least I'd have the hope he'd go into heaven. All right? At least I'd know he'll be chastised by God, he'll destroy his life, but he's going to heaven because he's placed his faith on Jesus Christ. Now, that's the bare minimum. I hope, no one's, I hope that's no one's like, real goal. Right? <laughs> Our real goal is to get them saved and for them to be faithful men of God, walking in the ways of the Lord. But notice this. When it comes to beating your son with a rod, it has an effect on delivering his soul from hell, which I'll get into later on. If you're wondering what does that have to do with being delivered from hell. But I want, I want you to notice verse number 13 again. The Bible says, Thou shalt beat him with a rod. Okay, the Bible says, Use an instrument. Don't use your hands. I'll tell you why you shouldn't use your hands. Okay? Number one, because if you're using your hands, it's going to hurt you. <laughs> All right? It's going to, you know, you want to inflict pain on him or her. You don't want to inflict pain on yourself, so don't use your hand. Use a rod. Use an instrument, you know. Um, uh, but secondly, use an instrument because it allows a consistent uh, level of pain. A consistent level of pain. You know, if you get, you, you'll become familiar, you know, when you use an instrument. Let, think of tennis, all right? You've got tennis players. Imagine if they were playing tennis with their hands. You know, the ball wouldn't get very far. You know, they, they wouldn't be able to strike it very well. So what do tennis players do is a tennis racket, right? You know, they become familiar with how to apply whatever pressure, whatever strength, whatever strike they need. If you're using an instrument, you'll become very attuned because you're not going to do this just once. You're going to, you know, it's going to happen from time to time where you're going to use that rod and you'll know how to apply the pro appropriate uh, pain for that child. You'll know. And look, and here's the thing about the instrument. You don't, need to inf you don't need to even give it that much force. When you've got something that's extended, just a little force is, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, sorry? What was that, Tony? Delivers. Delivers? Uh, it's not, I don't know what I'm saying. But I, I guess, yeah, it, I guess it, what I'm trying to say is it delivers a greater pain than what your hand would have by that movement alone. But the Bible's very clear. Look, use the rod. Use the rod to discipline your child. And, uh, you know, we are commanded to strike, which says to beat, to strike. And obviously, God does not advocate child abuse. Some people think this is child abuse. You know, I think I gave you a story once where I had somebody, a lady in, my, in my, my workplace says, oh, man, you've got such obedient kids. You know, you've got such lovely children. You know, they just sit there. They're just obedient. They're, they're, they're happy. How do you do it? How do you raise them? Oh, the rod? Oh, how dare you, <laughs> right? I'm going to call, you know, uh, what is it, docs on you. I'm going to call the Department of Chi the Children on you. What in the world? You just finished telling me, praising me how good my kids are, how happy they are. They don't look like abused children. They're well-dressed, they're well-fed, they can talk, they can communicate, they're happy, they're playing, they're playing, running around. Hey, they're great kids. You know why? Because we use the rod. Because we did it God's way. And God's way is obviously going to work the best. Uh, but make sure that, I guess the advice that I want to give you here is when your child disobeys, when they break your rules, you're going to naturally become angry. Okay, you're going to naturally have an emotion, an emotional reaction to that. And there's nothing wrong with your emotions. There's nothing wrong with getting angry because God has given you emotions so you can react in the right way. Imagine if your kids were just disobedient, were just, you know, uh, total reckless, and you never got angry about it then you'll never do anything about it, you know? You wouldn't have that emotion that drives you to discipline your children. But what I will say is you need to also, when you discipline your children, to be in control of your emotions. If your child has done something that's angered you so much, I would really recommend parents to take a breather, step away just for a moment, catch a breath, pray to the Lord, Lord, please help me give the appropriate discipline to my child, then come back when you've calmed down, and apply the right discipline. All I'm saying is, you know, nothing wrong with getting angry. That's what's going to drive you to do something about it. But make sure you're not out of control. Make sure you're not doing it. You know, you're doing it at soberly minded. Okay, you're in control of your emotions. And, uh, you know, I would encourage you to strike on their bare bottom. You know, I think that's the best place to strike your child. He's got plenty of padding right there. 
you know, pl pl you know, plenty of padding. There's no vital organs that you, you could potentially do any harm to. You know, if, if you strike your child on the, on the chest or in the stomach, you could hit some vital organs. But on the bottom, there's no vital organs there that you could cause any damage to. Um, you know, people have been disciplined right there for hundreds and thousands of years with no problem. You know, society continues, people continue. Hey, this is, the, this is the way people have been doing it throughout human history. It works. So continue doing it in the same way. And also the bo bottom has a high sensory area. So the pain that is felt there is usually much greater than anywhere else on the body. So that means you don't even have to inflict that much of a, of a strike for it to really hurt. You know, for it to be on the body because it's a, a high sensory area on the bottom. And so I really encourage you parents, please take the instructions of God on board. You know, and, and I'll tell you one reason why some parents don't do it. Um, because some parents, their children disobey like nonstop. They're just constantly disobeying parents. They're constantly talking back. You know, parents are saying, can you go clean your room? They're constantly not cleaning the room. And they're thinking, man, if I took that rod, if I took that belt or whatever it is, I'm just going to be spending all day, every day smacking that child. That's what they think. But no, 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 that's, that's misunderstanding. Once you do it once, they'll wake up, all right? You do it once, it's like, whoa, what, where'd that come from? Okay? <laughs> it's going to limit how much they disobey. You do it twice, they go, wow, you know, this is serious. You do it three times, say, this is becoming consistent. This is happening all the time. You do it day after day, week after week, your child will be like, man, I better start obeying my parents. I don't like this. So you're not going to be doing it the 10, 20 times that people think they're doing it. No. You know, it, I'll tell you the honest truth. For most of my children, I can't even remember the last time I smacked them. I can't remember the last time I took out the rod. For most of my, now I know some of the little ones because they're still growing, they're developing. But for some of them, I can't even remember, I can't even recall the last time I did it. Okay, because that's, the rod works. The rod works. Yes, maybe at the beginning it, you're required to do it a number of times. In due time, in due process, your child will be much more obedient and they'll need few spankings. To the point where, I can't even remember. You're going to get to a point where you're like, I can't even remember the last time I got out that belt. Praise God. It means the rod of correction has been working. You've been doing it God's way. Uh, so if you can go back to Proverbs 22. Go to Proverbs 22. You guys are in Proverbs. We'll, we'll look at a lot of Proverbs now. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Proverbs 22, verse 15, please. Why do we smack our children? Why is this the way that God has instructed us? Well, number one, it's for correction. Okay? It's to prevent the same mistakes from occurring again. Proverbs 22 verse 15. The Bible says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Parents, when your children disobey, don't think, ah, oh, my children are so evil and they're so wicked and so ungodly and panic. The Bible tells us, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You cannot have a child without the foolishness that is in his heart. They say, well, how do I deal with the foolishness? What did it just say there? The rod of correction shall drive it far from him. It doesn't say your five-minute time out will drive it far from him. It doesn't say taking away the PlayStation will drive it far from him. It doesn't say grounding him in his room and not letting him go see his friends will drive it away from him. It doesn't say deprive him from joys and, and things. No, it says the rod of correction will drive it far from him. You know, there are times when, when uh, you know, I, I might say to my children, I say, you know, uh, if you guys get your, your schoolwork done quickly, you do your chores, I'll take you to the park or, you know, Sunshine Coast, there's a lot of places to swim, you know, find a private area, I'll take you to the lake, we'll go for a swim, you get it all done, you do that. And, uh, there can be one child or maybe two that don't obey. Don't, they don't do what's right. And I'm very tempted. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the honest truth. I'm very tempted to go, all right, everyone, everyone can go except you. You're going to have to stay home. Everyone else is going to go to the lake and have a swim uh, to punish him. Like, that, that's how I feel that I should handle it. Okay? But here's the thing. I'm actually depriving that person, that child, 
from having time with the family. I'm depriving him from having time with mum and dad and having fun and creating those good memories of life by depriving him from these things because I think I'm going to correct him by doing that. That's not how you handle it. Hey, you didn't do in accordance to what we asked. You need the rod. You need the rod. We apply the rod. You cry some tears. And then we go for a swim at the lake. All right? It's all forgotten. It's all forgiven. It's all been done. And we all can enjoy time together. And so parents, please be careful about the temptations that come in your heart. I know what it's like. You'll th- think of some other ways to discipline your children. There's no other way. Okay, except using the rod of correction. It will drive the foolishness away from him. If you guys go to Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23 verse 14. Why else should we smack our children? And I already covered this briefly. Proverbs 23 verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Man, we want nothing more than our children to be delivered from hell, don't we? We want nothing more than see our children saved. What's going to get him to that point? It's the rod. Say, why is that? What, what does disciplining our children with the rod have anything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Here's what the reason is, guys. You knock on those doors, right? You knock on those doors every week. You know, are you 100% sure you'll be going to heaven? And those that say, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. Why do, why do they say they, they're, they're going to go to heaven? What's the, what's the number one answer? Tim? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Good works. I'm good! All right? No, 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 no. By using the rod of correction, you show them you're not good. Right? You show them you've done wrong. You've disobeyed mom and dad. You need discipline. You teach them there are consequences for breaking the rules. You teach them there are consequences for sinning. And when they do what's wrong and they get punished and they grow up, they're going to understand the concept of God here. When I do wrong, when I sin, well, that makes me deserving of hell. That makes me deserving of hell. And now they say, I need to be delivered from hell. I need to be delivered from this punishment that can come upon me. You know, I don't want to receive that. And they're more ready to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Listen, if you raise your children without the rod of correction, without proper discipline, they're going to think they're always good. They're going to think that there's no, there's no consequences for doing wrong. And when the gospel, one day the preacher comes to your child and gives them the gospel, they've all their life heard there's no consequences for sin. So why, why should I believe the wages of sin is death? Why should I believe in these things? That's the, the rod of correction is the gospel message all right, to the little child. And of course, that will help them understand what it means to have that heavenly father, what it means to be a sinner and what it means to not be a good person and needing to be punished. And of course, then appreciating, appreciating what Jesus Christ did for them to be that substitute for them on the cross. You know, he took that punishment. He became sin for them. And they'll be able to fully understand the concept of punishment and the consequences of of sin and the, the consequences, which is punishment. All right. So why do we smack our children for correction and also to save their soul from hell? Listen, if you disagree with me with anything else about this, this uh, sermon, at least agree with me on this one. Use the rod of correction. It will save your child from hell. It will deliver them from hell. Okay? If there's any reason to use it, that should be number one driving reason why you should be using the rod of correction. Now go to Proverbs 13, verse 24, please. Proverbs 13, verse 24. People ask these kind of questions. You know, what, at what age should I be smacking my child? How old are they? In, you know, how old when, uh, are they when they can understand these things? And again, you know, again, I think I have, I'm qualified to speak, okay? So many kids, right? I personally believe that a child that's even six months old, I'm not talking about the rod right now, I'm just saying a child that's six months old is old enough to understand what is right and wrong. So how's that possible? Well, mums and dads, you know when you're changing that child's nappy, okay? And it's filthy, and you need to make sure you're careful because otherwise it's going to get everywhere. But then that child starts to, to wiggle and fidget and, and, and you know, it start, you know, starts to put his, his hand down there, starts making a mess. You know what that child needs? A little tap on the thigh. No, don't touch. No, don't move. You do that, after a while, they're not going to move. After a while, it's going to have a little sting there on my thigh. You know? I mean, they don't fully understand what's going on. They don't fully understand how dirty the diaper is, the nappy is but they understand that pain. <laughs> I better not put my hand there because I'm going to get a little sting. All right? 
trust me, at six months old, they get it. They get it. They get it. And so the Bible tells us here in Proverbs 22, verse 15. Oh, sorry, Proverbs, you guys in 13, verse 24. Uh, yeah, Proverbs 13, verse 24. The Bible says here, He that spareth his rod hateth his child, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. Now that word be times means early. You chasten him early. Now parents, you're going to know your children the best. Okay, you'll know when the right time is for you to take that rod and apply them on, on the bottom. Okay, and let me just tell you, we start pretty early. Okay, and of course, we're not going to discipline uh, a two year old as harshly as I would a 12 year old. Of course, it should be appropriate to their age. Okay, appropriate to their little frame. Hey, but some sting, some pain will send that message to them very early. It says, be times. You start disciplining your children as soon as you can. I'm telling you, at six months old, they get a little pain. They understand it. They get it. All right? It works. God's word is true. You know, God, there's, there's, there's wisdom in God's word, and we just need to trust God's word that it's correct. And look how verse 13, uh, 24 started. He that spareth the rod... If you don't use the rod, you hateth his son. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now, I don't know. Maybe some of you have not used the rod before, the belt or whatever, some instruments. Maybe some of you have not. You know, there's been times where you know you should take your child and, and use that rod in them. Maybe there's come those times that you said, you know, I'm not, not going to do it. You know what, why you did it? Because you hate your son. That's what the Bible says. The reason you avoided using the rod that one occasion is because you hated your child at that point in time. You know, that should be shameful for you. If you love your children, you need to use the rod. And again, it says, He that loveth him, chasteneth him be times early. Not only at an early age, but when it comes to, to the time, uh, you know, when you think about things, something that's early, I would strongly encourage you, chastise your child as soon as possible. As soon as they've done something wrong, chastise your son. Now, it's very easy when you're in the home, okay? When you're in the home, they've done something wrong, take them immediately and deal with it immediately, okay? Deal with it immediately. Be times, early. Do it straight away. Don't delay the time because children tend to forget what they did wrong. They may not fully understand why they've been disciplined now. You know, it's probably gone several hours and why am I doing it now? The only time I would delay it, that I personally delay it, and I think you should too, is uh, in public. In public, okay? Uh, let me give you some thoughts around this because, you know, let's say I had my children here and they disobeyed in church. Uh, they were mucking around in church or being loud and whatever, you know, this breaking things or I don't know, whatever. <coughs> disobedient to mums and dads. If I just took them right there and disciplined them, now, I, I don't have a problem with that because I would, I'll be showing you that I love my son, right? But what would it do to my child? It embarrass them. I mean, uh, think about it. If you were disciplined in front of everybody in public, wouldn't you be pretty embarrassed? They'd be pretty embarrassed. You know, when I've had to, when I've, had, I've managed staff before, when I've had to correct staff and tell them they've done wrong, you know what I've done? I've not yelled at them in front of everybody else. I've taken them into the office privately and had a word with them. Why? Because I want them to fix things. I want them to fix things. I'm not trying to embarrass them. I'm not trying to destroy them. I'm not trying to dampen their spirits. And so what tends to happen if we're out and about in public and my children do wrong, I'll go up to them and say, look, you continue this. Well, number one, you know what's going to happen when you get home, right? But number two, if you continue this, it's going to be much worse. And quite often when they muck up in public, at home, the punishment is two times as much, all right? So if I was just going to give them, a, like, let's say I gave them two wax normally for something they did at home, if they did in public, when we get home, it'll be full. It'll be double, Okay. So that's how, I, that's how I personally deal with it. That's how I personally deal with it because I expect them to be at behaving better in public than they do at home. That's my expectation amongst other people. And so we should love our children. We should chasten him with the rod. And again, make sure it is age appropriate for your child. You want discipline your child as hard when they're two-year-old, three-year-old, as much as a 10, 11, 12-year-old child. Okay. Now, number five, the next thing that I've got here with um, admonishing your children, there should be some actions after you smack your child. It's not just you smack your child and you walk away. All right, we've dealt with it. Let's, go, let's, let's carry on. It shouldn't be like that, okay? 
if you've done things prob prob uh, prob properly, after you've smacked your child, your child will be upset that they misbehaved. They might even cry. Now, children will cry for two things, either the pain of the smack or just crying because they let down mum and dad. They just feel bad about it. I'll cry about that. Okay? Um, your child should understand, should be upset, should understand they've done something wrong. Now, if you apply a couple of smacks and they're like, Arr! they haven't learned anything. Okay? It means you need to do it again. And it probably means you're doing it a little too soft. Okay? It probably means your technique needs to be improved. All right? And parents, you know what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> After a while, it's like, Arr! No. They need to learn that they've done something wrong. Okay? And if you notice that they're upset, they, they, they've taken the lesson, they've taken it on board, then teach them to apologize, to say sorry, and ask for forgiveness. Okay? Now, we're commanded as children of God, once you're saved, when we sin against the Lord, that we're commanded to go and confess our sins, right? And we know that the Lord will forgive us for those sins. Well, again, using the example of God, we should teach our children how to say sorry. You know, it's very hard to say sorry. I'm very good at it now. I'm actually really good at it. There was a time when I was very, I used to be stubborn as a child. My mom would say, Kevin, you can go say sorry to your dad. And I'm like, no, nah, not doing it, you know. And then after a few hours, I feel really bad and go and do it, right? But we need to teach our children. As children, it's, it's hard to say sorry. That's very easy. I say sorry all the time. You know, it's very easy for me to say sorry. Uh, but I've, I've learned that lesson, obviously. But we need to teach our children to say sorry ask for, and to ask for forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Now, look, if someone's wronged you and come up to you and says, you know what, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? Your heart will immediately be like, yeah, I mean, look, look he's humbled himself. Look at him. He's done, look. You know, he's really hurt me, but I can see he's, he's humble. He wants to get this settled. Yeah, of course I'll forgive you. That's sort of your natural reaction. You teach your children to do these things. And you ought to forgive them just as your Heavenly Father has forgiven you. Okay? And it's not just forgive, but it's forgive and forget. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I am He that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will remember, sorry, and will not remember thy sins. That's the God that we worship. Not only will He blot out our transgressions when we're saved, He says, I will not remember thy sins. Praise God, because there are a lot of sins that I've done that I don't want God to remember. I thank God, right? Now he's forgiven me, it's done away with, now he's forgotten about it. That's how we need to be with our children. You discipline your child. Let's, uh, let's say you gave your child the chores to wash the dishes, all right? Let's say that's the whatever. And they don't do it. And you go and you take them and you discipline them. A week later when they don't, let's say that they're meant to do it, wash the dishes again next week and they don't do it. If you go up to them, after, the, after you've disciplined them and smacked them and they've apologized and you go up to them and say, hey, you know, just like last week, last week you didn't wash the dishes and now you're doing it again. Have you forgotten? No, you've brought it back up. Hey, you've already dealt with last week. Last week's been dealt with. Don't worry about that. Forget it. Start again. They've done it again. They need the discipline again. Forget last week, okay? And sometimes this is the nature of children. They need to learn things more than once. This is why we need to hear preaching of the Bible. We need the same doctrines taught because we forget. All right? We need to be refreshed. We need to remember things. We need to hear things more than once. I know I need to. Christina needs to tell me things more than once for, for things to go into my head. All right? And we need sometimes to give our children the patience, understand they're going to have to maybe learn this lesson more than once, but forget the previous lessons they've been dealt with. Just deal with the current situation. Or, you know, they've done something wrong and you just keep bringing it up. You keep bringing it up. Even, even in jest. Oh, I remember that time when you... Listen, don't do that. Don't do it in jest. Don't bring it up. Forget about it. Okay? God has forgiven. He's forgotten. That's how we need to be with our children. Forgive them and uh, forget the sins they committed. Go to Proverbs 13 now. Proverbs 13 verse 24 Oh, well, actually, you were there already. But anyway, I'll just read it again. Proverbs 13, verse 24. We've read this one already, but just to reinforce the point. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. Well, what I want to say is after you smack your child and they're crying and teary, they've said sorry, make sure, reinforce the fact that you love them. Make sure they understand the reason you disciplined them, you gave them pain, is because you love them. Okay? And sometimes, every now and again, I, I don't do this all the time, but sometimes when I just, I just have a heavy heart, it's, it's not easy to discipline your children. Like, it's not like, woohoo, I guess to do this again. I hate doing it. But I do it because I love my child. 
The Bible says if I do it, I love my child. But every now and again, I, I do it and I'm like, you know, son or, you know, why, do, why did I discipline you? Because you love me, he says. You know, it's like, yeah, that's right, because I love you. You know, I don't want you to waste your life. I don't want you to destroy your life. I want you to know what's right and do things in accordance to God's word. You know, give them a hug. You know, give them a kiss. Give them a cuddle. Say, look, it's all done. It's behind us now. You know, dry up your tears. Get back out there. It's all forgiven. Let's just get back. Back or back. You know, let's go for the swim in the lake or whatever it is. Whatever, whatever's coming up, right? You know, encourage them. Show them that you love them. Because too many kids, when they get disciplined, feel like their parents hate them. You need to make sure you convey the message of love after you smack your children. And the last point that I have with admonishing and disciplining your children is the question, you know, is there ever a time not to smack? Now, I, I would love to say no. <laughs> All right? I, I would love to say there's never not a time to smack. I think you should, you know, as a general rule of thumb, if your children have been disobedient, you, you should be thinking about that rod, Okay. But there are two exceptions to this that I personally have that I want to share with you. Two exceptions where I would not smack my child if they've done wrong. Firstly, when the parent has caused them to misbehave. Okay, when the parent has caused them to misbehave. Let me give you some thoughts about this. Have you ever seen, you know, little Johnny? I shouldn't say Johnny because I've got Johnny. I don't want to say Johnny. I feel bad for Johnny. Little, little Tony, right? When you've got little Tony and he's misbehaving. Have you ever seen the parents just like laugh? <laughs> Look at my son go. You know, he's breaking the rules, he's being disobedient. <laughs> well, that's so funny. Man, that's horrible. You know, you're, you're teaching that child to be disobedient. You're, you're, you're showing them, hey, they get attention and laughter, you know, when they do wrong. And so some, those parents should not be disciplining the children when they're doing wrong because the parents have driven them to be doing what's wrong. And, but, you know, even, you, know, you say, well, I'll never do that. But, you know, we can all play a part in our children's disobedience. Maybe, maybe, maybe number one, we did not make the rules clear. You know, I told you we need to set rules and boundaries. Maybe you didn't make it clear enough. Maybe they didn't understand what those boundaries were, what those rules were. Number two, maybe they followed your bad example. This is why one of my points was be a good example. Maybe they've done something they saw mom and dad do and you're, you're going to now discipline them. No, don't. They did it because of you. You should be disciplined, right? not your child. They're just doing what mom and dad are doing. You know, um, if so, if they see you do something wrong, bad behavior, and they've emulated that behavior, go and sit with your child and tell your child, listen, son, I did wrong. You know, you saw mom and dad do that the other day. We did wrong. Own up to your mistakes. Your children will, will respect you when they see mom and dad are able to humble themselves. Like, you know what, mom and dad, we were wrong. And we had an effect on you. I'm sorry. We're going to change this. You need to change this about what you did. We're going to change it so we don't influence you in the wrong uh, way. And, um, and again, this is your chance to ex examine and improve yourself also. When you're disciplining your children, you should be thinking, am I setting that good example? Am I doing what's right? Am I living the way I want my children to live? So that's number one, when you've caused them to misbehave. Number two, the other reason why I, I would not smack my child is... Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you from Lamentations. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it's a very famous passage. I'll just read it to you. It says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Do you know what that means? If you're being consumed, you're being destroyed. You know why God doesn't destroy us? It says, It is of the Lord's mercies. You know, God has mercy on us. If He did not have mercy on us, He would have destroyed us long ago. In fact, He almost did with the flood. You know, he had, you know he found, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, uh, but because of his mercies, and it says here, because his compassions fail not. You see, he's merciful, he has compassion. Verse number 23, they are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. We have a faithful, compassionate, and merciful God. And so I personally think if that's the attribute of God, I know I probably need God's chastisement at certain points in my life that I've done wrong, but it didn't come. And I just sort of think, I think God's been merciful. I think he's shown me some grace, a bit of time, a bit of time to reflect and do what's right. And I think what's happening here, guys, is that we need to understand, not only do we need to teach our children um, that uh, there are consequences to their sin, but from time to time, from time to time, on those rare occasions, there is a time for you to show some mercy to your children. 
I'll give you one example straight away of how I show mercy to my children. When they've done something wrong, okay, and instead of hiding it, they've come to tell me. And they've owned up to the mistake. You know, well, I stuffed up, Dad. I did this, and I, I want to tell you. I, I might still smack them. I might. I might. But if I did, I, I'd do it much more mercifully. Like, it'd probably be a much, much smaller one. Or maybe skip it altogether. Basically, when my child does something wrong, and I can tell they're sorry and they're sad about it, they're not sad because they got caught. They're sad. They're truly sad because of what they did, and they want to rectify that thing. That's the point where I personally would show my children some mercy. Okay? And again, why would I do that? It's because I'm trying to teach my children that our God of the Bible is also a merciful God. To appreciate the mercy when it comes. But you need to be very careful about that. Okay? Very careful. Your rule of thumb should be the rod. Okay? If you're constantly... Um, um, you know what? In 2020... What's next year? 2020. In 2020, I'm just going to teach my kids the mercies of God. So every time they disobey, I'm just never going to discipline them. Listen, that's not teaching them the mercies of God. They're just going to think, well, now I can just get away with everything. And they're not going to appreciate the mercy. You only appreciate the mercy when you understand the punishment, when you can fully understand the punishment. You only appreciate the mercy of God for your salvation when you understand you are destined to hellfire and you've been delivered from that. Okay, so there's a right time to be merciful, but make sure that's not the you know, the, the, the primary way that you teach and train your children. So that's all I've got for you guys. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but just, just in quick summary, you know, we're instructed in the Word of God to raise them in the nurture, training them, you know, guiding them, leading them, and the admonishment, correcting them, disciplining them in the Lord, you know, of the Lord. Those are the things we need to bring together. And if you're, you know, praise God if you're doing some of it, but are you doing all of it? Are both these things in your family's life? Are both these things there as you raise your children? If not, I'd ask that you seriously consider this. You know, we want our children to grow up to be a godly seed. That's why the Lord has given us marriage. That's why the Lord has allowed us to find a married partner to raise that godly seed. Are you doing it for the Lord or are you not? <laughs>